Well, um, okay. So returning to uh, the, the third temptation of our Lord in the desert, uh, we go back to uh, St. Luke and uh, he writes, and he being the devil took him, Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels charge of you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now, Father Vince, can you, I want to ask you about the role of Latin, uh, because I, you know, Latin, I understand, uh, I, from what I've heard, demons hate Latin, and, um, you know, the, uh, I, in the Latin masses, I understand, you know, there's a lot of, like, exorcism prayers, or, like, in, in baptism and stuff, so, you know, that Latin and exorcism or exorcism prayers really kind of go hand in hand or they work together very well. Can you speak to the role of Latin in exorcisms and the rights of the church in the battle against the devil? It's important to note that the devil hates the church. Mm -hmm. Latin is the official language of the church. So it reflects the institution of the church herself. So Satan would certainly lash out against that. You know, one of my favorite definitions of the church is that the church is the guardian to the tree of life. So think of the fall of Adam and Eve when they were cast out of paradise. Mm -hmm. Christ has given us the church as the vehicle so that we may arrive at the tree of life and then ultimately enter into the presence of God the Father for all eternity. And the devil believes that if he can destroy the church, then humanity would be permanently trapped in sin as are he and all the other fallen angels. So anything that has to, to do with representing the church, the devil would want to attack and destroy that. And because again, Latin is the official language of the church, exorcists will tell you that it is a very powerful weapon, if you will, in our arsenal to defeat what the devil is trying to do in the lives of people. Mm interesting i'm right now i'm reading uh bishop schneider's book the catholic mass uh he just came out with it and it's it's about restoring the centrality of you know god and and our liturgical worship and and the part i'm at right now i mean he talks about the importance of latin as a, a sacred language right and like how it's he kind of makes the, the historic point that like latin you know, it kind of like in the same way that I think Hebrew at one point for the Jews in the temple, there was a certain Hebrew that it was sacred. It was elevated language, right? So it's like it was set apart. It was consecrated, you know, which is, you know, in the vernacular, we kind of lose some of that, right? That kind of everyday language, and you know, so that Latin has that, that kind of special character. Um, now, you know, Father Vince, you know, again, here we are, we're in Lent and we're in Atridium and, you know, we're, we're recording this on Holy Thursday and, um, you know, we're about to enter into the, our Lord's passion with Good Friday and whatnot. And I want to ask you about the role of redemptive suffering and what, what it, redemptive suffering can play in the battle against the demonic. Um, you know, and for instance, can someone else, like a father, going back to what Jesse was saying earlier, could a father offer up his sufferings, fastings, and trials on behalf of, of a child or, a, you know, his wife or a friend who's the victim of a demonic attack. People need to realize that there is redemptive value in suffering. Just because somebody is suffering doesn't mean that they have been abandoned by God. Mm -hmm. There is redemptive value in suffering. If there wasn't, then Jesus on the cross would make no sense whatsoever. You know, God never promised that we wouldn't go through darkness in our lives. He never promised that we wouldn't suffer, but he did promise that he would always be with us. You know, I think of Psalm 23. I like to tell people my favorite word in Psalm 23, depending on the translation you're using, is the word through. Even though I walk through the valley of darkness, it lets us know that the darkness is not permanent. It's only something that we're passing through. And the darkness can be synonymous with suffering that we 
all go through in this life. And coming through that suffering, we can actually come out even more strengthened and even more committed to our relationship with God. One might think of Job in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, God permitted Satan to afflict him. But as a result of Job's fidelity to God, going through that suffering, that trial, if you will, God blessed him a hundredfold. So again, there is redemptive value in suffering, and it is possible for one to suffer on behalf of another. So there can be victim souls, for example, mm -hmm. people that would choose to suffer for someone else, to take their pain and suffering upon themselves. It's exactly what Christ has done for us on the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, the word redemption, I always like to ask people again, do you know what the word redemption really means? And the word redemption means to buy back. So what is Jesus doing for us on the cross? He's bought, buying us back from the sin, the original sin of Adam and Eve there in the garden. So he's paying the price for our sins. Mm -hmm. And as Jesse alluded to earlier, you know, the role of the father in a household can take on that role of redemptive suffering, being a victim soul, if you will, for members of his own family. And again, why would a father do that? Because of the unconditional love that a father should have for the members of his household, because it demonstrates the same unconditional love that God has for each and every one of us. We are all God's children. We are all created in the image and likeness of God. And God, you know, he loves us. And that's why, again, we need to realize there is a value in redemptive suffering and it is possible for one to suffer on behalf of someone else. So, you know, speaking of someone who suffered on behalf of others, you know, I, I want to ask you, Jesse, about our blessed mother and uh, the great gift that she is, you know. So tomorrow is Good Friday. And the last, the, almost the last thing that Jesus said from the cross the last thing he said from the cross was into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. But before that, he gives to St. John and to all of us, you know, outside of the Eucharist, the greatest gift that he could give us, which is his mother, you know, behold your mother. And um, so Jesse, I want to ask you, can you speak to Mary's role as our battlefield commander, <laughs> as it were, in today's spiritual battle? The devil and demons, uh, they don't have bodies, so they, they are bound by the spiritual laws that God has, has ordained, that God has written. Mm -hmm. You and me, we have a body and a spirit, so we're bound by physical and spiritual laws. Demons are just bound by spiritual laws. The demons know every single verse in God's word, all 37,500 verses in God's word. They know the Genesis 3.15 mandate obligation order command they know that the mother of the messiah was given by god total coercive power and juridical authority over satan and every single demon they're bound by that it's it's fixed into their diabolical matrix and there's nothing they can do about it this is why People like Cardinal Norberto Rivera, who is a re he's a retired cardinal in Mexico, but he teaches uh, in the School of Exorcism out in Mexico City. He says the Blessed Virgin Mary is the chief exorcist in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. a chief exorcist. And he says mm -hmm. that when she appears at an exorcism, she doesn't even have to say anything, Cardinal Norberto Rivera. She shows up and demons leave. Again, because they know that, uh, as St. Louis de Montfort says, looking at Jesus Christ, he's the head. We are the body of Christ. St. Louis de Montfort says, Our Lady is the neck. She's the neck of the mystical body. And so the, all the graces that flow from the Godhead, from the Trinity, flow through Mary, the neck, to the mystical body. All the distribution happens through Mary, the mediatrix of all graces. And by the same token, when we pray, even Protestants will learn that in the, in the next life at their judgment. When we pray, all our prayers rise up like incense 
to God, but they go to God through the mediatrix, the neck, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And again, this is the way the economy of grace flows, and the devil knows this. Mm -hmm. And the devil knows that he's bound, he's bound and he's subject to this queen mother, to this, uh, to this, uh, to the, the one that's immaculately conceived and full of grace. Mm -hmm. And it's also humiliating because God the Father has given the mother of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15 the power to crush the devil's head. Why didn't God say, I give you the power to crush his, his spine or his tail or, or anything, you know, or the, or the last quadrant of his body? Why the head? Because the head is generally, by the, by the spiritual writers, it's associated as the place of pride. So it's the all humble, all immaculate, full of grace, queen mother that's given power to crush the head of the devil. And again, this humiliates him. You know why? Because demons understand, mm -hmm. based on Hebrews chapter 1, that on earth, human beings were of a lower nature than they are. Hebrews chapter 1. Mm -hmm. And so for the devil to wrap his mind around that God who's supernatural has given a human, Mary, she's not a God, mm -hmm. has given a woman, albeit God's masterpiece, has given woman power and authority over the preternatural world. The pre angels and demons in this life, they are above humans in terms of their nature, their angelic nature. And so it humbles, it shames the devil that somebody of a lower nature, a human person, has power and coercive authority over the preternatural demons. Uh, again, this is something that, because they're pure pride, they're pure narcissist, this is something that causes them shame. Yeah, and I, and I don't know who said it. Uh, maybe you all do, but I, I want to say that it's been said uh, that when Satan or Lucifer said, I will not serve, what he was talking about at that time was, um, and I think it must have been revealed to a mystic or something, but you know, he was saying that he would not serve, like when God revealed his master plan and revealed that, you know, salvation would come through this little teenage Hebrew girl, uh, complete humility, right? Just, just living in a backwater town and, you know, all of that, that Satan in his pride said, I will not serve. And it was because he refused to bow down to Mary that led him to to fall and and then i think saint louis de montfort said that in a certain sense satan fears mary even more than god himself why uh because you know if you measure your own strength against the strength of your enemies you know god is he's all powerful but mary again is this humble little creature and for her and her humility and her docility to master him just is just more than his his pride can can handle you know so um it just you know it just speaks to like again the wonder of god and giving us what you know such a great gift you know in his blessed mother now you know kind of taking this to a time you know in our, our timeliness here uh you know last month pope francis uh consecrated russia and the ukraine to the immaculate heart of mary uh in keeping with the the prophecy at fatima and i know there's like there's a lot of discussion about you know was it done entirely right or not right you know and and i'm not i'm not a fatima expert so I'm, i can't really say but jesse uh, for instance can you explain why it was important from a spiritual warfare perspective to consecrate russia to the immaculate heart of mary I'll say three things that uh, that bode well for the consecration. Number one, Pope Francis holds the highest office on planet Earth. When God from heaven looks down on people on planet Earth, his office is higher than a president, prime minister, king. There, there is no higher office in the kingdom of God than the papacy. So number one, he, his office just in itself uh, uh, has incredible power to unleash grace and blessings, the opposite. 
Number two, right before he did the consecration, he went to confession, mm -hmm. which puts him in a state of grace, which makes your prayer more powerful. James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous man has much power. So we see the power of his office, Matthew 16, 18, the power of the keys at play, mm -hmm. which is powerful in itself. He was in a state of grace. He just went to confession right before he did the consecration. And number three, he did a consecration prayer where he mentioned Russia. I know some people say, well, why did he mention Ukraine? Well, Ukraine was part of Russia yeah. uh, back when the Fatima apparitions were given. Ukraine was part of Russia. Mm -hmm. Well, why did he mention humanity? Well, guess what? He's praying for human beings, not Martians. He's not playing, praying for, you know, <laughs> uh, you know uh, fish in the ocean. He's praying for human beings. So it's like that, that's, that's not something to argue about that he mentioned humanity. Of course, the human beings have a rational soul. God died for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so um, all I can, now the only concern of mine is I hope it hasn't been done too late. Mm -hmm. It was done. Russia was mentioned. He has the office of Peter, and he would done it in a state of grace. Check, check, check. Uh, I just hope that, because there is a, a sister, Lucia, did mention post-1917. Yeah. What year? Uh, she said that hopefully, you know, that the consecration will not be done too late. That's, yeah. we'll see. Time will tell. Yeah, I think they, they did say something like it would be done, but it would be late. And I think it was, I think this is like the eighth time that a pope has tried to do it, you know, for, for whatever reason. I mean, they're, you know, Pope John Paul, and I'm not sure if Pius the 12th, but, you know, there's other folks who know better than I do the Fatima history. But, um, but yeah, you know, again, it's calling upon our Immaculate Mother to intercede you know, in, in these times, I mean, they just, it seems so, so relevant today to where we find ourselves in the culture and the attacks, like Mary said of Fatima, the, the final battles would be fought, you know, on the family. And like you alluded to earlier, Jesse, you know, about like the role of the father being a St. Joseph um, and you, Father Vince saying, you know, about sufferings, you know, and offering our redemptive suffering on behalf of our loved ones. You know, it's, this is, this is the time for it, I think. And our blessed mother is, is a great aid and solace to us as we, you know, we kind of walk through these final days of Lent. So, well, I want to thank both of you for joining me for, uh, for this discussion. I really appreciate it so much. Um, Father Vince, as we, uh, as we close out, would you be so kind as to, uh, impart a blessing upon us and all our, our viewers and their families? Let us bow our heads and pray. May Almighty God watch over, bless, and protect you. May you always know of God's presence in your life. May the joy of Easter radiate throughout all of your lives and into the lives of those that you love. May Almighty God bless each and every one of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.